It's not on. Buenas tardes. It is, um, thank you for inviting me to Panama. It, uh, I lived in Singapore for 20 years, and I must say, Panama reminds me of Singapore. Um, the dengue vaccine has attracted a lot of media attention, especially in the past one year, and especially in the Philippines. And it's rather um, challenging to cover the complex issues of the dengue vaccine within 20 minutes. Um, I had the privilege of working for WHO as consultant, and as such, I coordinated the SAGE working group on, the, on dengue vaccine and um, published the position paper of, uh, on the, of the SAGE group on, on the dengue vaccine, and they were published uh, in September, so just, just very recently. So, um, you are all very familiar with dengue, so just very brief, um, four serotypes, um, clinical, manage, clinical manifestations from asymptomatic to rarely death. The first infection is usually mild, moderate, or can be severe, but it's the second infection that is associated with more severe disease. From longitudinal cohort studies, we know that the third and fourth infection are actually very mild. So the case fatality rate is very low. So the, the problem of dengue is the high burden of disease with about 100 million uh, cases per year. And that is the reason why we need the dengue vaccine. So after several decades of intense research, we finally have three leading vaccine candidates. These three candidates have a similar, are all quite similar uh, vaccines. They are life attenuated, recombinant, tetravalent uh, vaccines, and the difference is mainly in their backbone. So for, um, for the Sanofi Pasteur producting vaccine, CID TDV, the backbone is yellow fever. For the um, Takeda product, the backbone is a dengue serotype 2. And for the, um, the NIH um, 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 vaccine that is currently being trialed in Budantan, through Budantan in Brazil, it, uh, they have actually three full genomic viruses and one is, has the backbone of, of dengue 4. A serotype 2 has a backbone of, of, dengue, of, of dengue serotype 4. So the first um, vaccine was licensed in December 2015. And so really, why did it take so long to develop a vaccine. And there are many reasons that make dengue vaccine development so difficult, but the main reason is this. It is the immunological interference of the four serotypes. So if you have one infecting serotype, it will cause a homotypic, solid, lifelong immunity. But at the same time as it as an infection, it also triggers what we call a heterotypic antibody response. This heterotypic anti -re antibody response to the other serotypes is short-lived and partial, offers short-lived and partial protection. But as, and during that time, it actually protects against um, reinfection, against infection with another serotype. But then over time, these, um, the, 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 um, the heterotypic antibodies decline. And at a time when they decline to a certain level, then the risk is increased for severe, for enhancing disease. So it really depends on the timing and antibody levels, whether uh, these heterotypic antibodies are protective or destructive. And, and that is really the quintessence of the whole problem of dengue vaccine development. So if you, if you understand this slide, you will understand really what is happening with the, with the dengue vaccine. What you can also see here is that at the time of a natural infection, um, when you now do a PRNT test, a plaque reduction neutralization assay, you can actually measure all four serotypes, or three out of four serotypes, uh, because you cannot differentiate between heterotypic, cross-reactive, and between 
homotypic antibodies. So your PRNT may be misleading, and indeed this also played out in the whole, in the dengue vaccine trials. So here you can see how it played out. So the phase two trials, oh sorry, I have to go back. The phase two trials showed, if you agree with me, a relatively balanced tetravalent immune response to all four stereotypes. And the company was, was, that, that was so confident that based on these results, they went ahead to build their, their manufacturing capabilities, even before the phase three trial results were out. Unfortunately, this relatively balanced immunogenicity did not translate into a balanced um, vaccine uh, response, a vaccine efficacy. So the vaccine efficacy varied by uh, several factors. By serotype, it was better for serotype four and three. By serostatus, what is serostatus? Serostatus means um, you have had, if you're seropositive, you've had a dengue infection before. If you're seronegative, you did not have a, a dengue infection before. So it, the vaccine efficacy was higher with seropositivity. The vaccine also performed better in, in reducing more severe disease. And that is, of course, also good news because what we really want is to prevent more severe disease. And it performed better in, an older, in the older age groups. So given this whole complexity, the WHO is always called upon once a vaccine is licensed then to give guidance. And uh, with this complexity, the WHO decided to go for a restrictive use. So it restricted to areas with documented seroprevalence above 70%. And the rationale for this is that your public health benefit is highest in a population of high seroprevalence and the safety ben benefit is also best in such a setting. So this was in April 2016. Um, by that, uh, within those years, so, so the vaccine is now a CYD, TDV, the Sanofi Pasteur product is now um, uh, licensed in about 20 countries. And two countries at the time, in 2016, introduced the vaccine in a national program, and that was the um, Philippines and Paraná State in, in Brazil. In uh, the Philippines, they vaccinated about one million children. So what happened then? In... Uh, on the 29th of November 2017, I know that date because it changed my life and suddenly I had to work seven times, 24 hours at WHO. The release came that they had done additional analyses which found that in the longer term, more cases of severe disease um, was, was, um, uh, was observed. And the recommendation was then for individuals who have not been previously infected, vaccination should not be recommended. This immediately, of course, resulted in a major outcry in the Philippines. Mothers went onto the street, parents and communities came together to, to sue the company. The whole country was in outroar. The whole, everyone was talking about the dengue vaccine. So while parents of vaccine victims were seeking justice, unfortunately, also politics came into play in the Philippines. So the new president, Duterte, accused the previous uh, president, I think Aquino, for introducing the vaccine as, as an election campaign. And so the, all the ministers um, lost their job, um, PIs were put under criminal charges, it was a mess. But there was more to it, as also, there was also a lot of collateral damage. So in the, whole, in the, in the, in the Philippines, vaccine confidence uh, was lost. And, and vaccine uptake reduced and is now, I think, down to 30 to 40 percent. And, and measles outbreaks are now reported as a collateral damage. So, let's now move back to the science. How did Sanofi Pasteur determine the serostatus dependent performance? So, this is a reminder of the trial design. Um, and at baseline, they did not take blood samples from all um, trial participants, but they did at month 13. 
So what they did was they took all the blood samples from month 13 and used a novel NS1-based um, antibody and ELISA to differentiate between a yellow fever component of their backbone versus a natural acquired dengue infection. And then they retrospectively tried to determine baseline serostatus. This study, this study design also reminds, remind us that the first 25 months was the active surveillance to determine efficacy. But then after 25 months, the study design was, was changed to hospital-based surveillance. So the long-term data are all for the hospital-based surveillance to discover hospitalized and severe dengue. And I will now show you the results that Sanofi Pasteur published in a New England journal not too long ago. So vaccine efficacy against symptomatic virologically confirmed dengue in the first 25 months of the efficacy trial was, is, was different between seropositives and seronegatives. It was good it was good for seropositives and non-existent for seronegatives. Now we come to the um, longer term, so over, six, over almost five years of observation for the hospitalized cases, um, they found that the relative risk of severe dengue in seronegatives, uh, sorry, was three, whilst seropositives were protected. So the relative, so the efficacy can be calculated as one minus RR, so the efficacy for seropositives was about 82%, so that's good. But here, this is of concern, so three times higher risk of having severe dengue. And this risk started to occur at about 30 months after the first dose of vaccination. So this is not an immediate problem, but a problem that occurred 30 months later. Similar to what I showed to you, because you have transient heterotypic protection, that then, and then with waning antibodies, you may then have enhanced disease, and so this is what's now reflected in these observations. So this brings it all together, and I really like this slide, because it is, it's so basically the, um, the red are the, the seropositives, and the, line, the dotted line is, are the vaccinated, and the continuous line are the placebo. That means those who did not receive the vaccine. This, these lines really show, uh, it's a natural experiment that, that just proves again that seropositives, unvaccinated now, so seropositive placebos are at a higher risk than seronegatives for developing disease, right? The epidemiological observation that we've always had. This is here the best evidence, a really beautiful study. Seropositives are at higher risk. And now you see the seropositives, if vaccinated, really have reduced um, um, uh, incidence of severe dengue. So this is the good news. But the blue lines, the seronegatives, placebos here, Unfortunately, the vaccinated at about 30 months overtake the risk of the seronegatives. And this risk now moves toward a seropositive. In other words, a vaccinated seronegative now behaves epidemiologically like an unvaccinated seropositive. Clinically, also those two look totally alike. So we have now made a seronegative unvaccinated into a vaccinated into seropositive um, unvaccinated. So how do we explain these observations? Um, the best, I think, is, is probably this. Here you can see the percentage of subjects with detectable viremia after a single dose in seronegative subjects. And you see that viremia was actually only shown for serotype 4. So it appears not to be and an serotype 4 vaccine, but an immune dominant serotype 4 vaccine. So remember, you may, you may have your in, induced serotype 4, and may then also, you then measure the PNT, you measure all the others, but then the others are heterotypic and drop. And indeed, this could be shown with depletion assays. Depletion assays is, is where you try to tease out 
the, the, um, the serotype specific against the cross-reactive antibodies. And what they could show was that the, um, that the serotype specific antibodies were good for serotype 4, but that they were more cross-reactive for serotype 2. So this explains our observation. A very good study showing the antibody, antibody levels matter is a large Nicaraguan cohort study led by Eva Harris that showed that, that at a certain antibody ratio, your risk of severe dengue increases. So you are protected with a very, very high antibody level and a very, very low antibody level. But if you are in between, you're at, epidemiologically at higher risk for severe dengue. This is probably the best epidemiological, clinical epidemiological study that proves the ADE, the antibody dependent enhancement theory, which was so shown in vitro, now it also proves it in vivo. So the, explanar the explanatory hypothesis is that the vaccine in seronegative, in seronegatives um, acts like a silent infection. So now they have had a silent infection when these then have their true first natural infection, it acts like a secondary infection. So you have more severe disease, but then you will have protection against in third and fourth. Now in seropositives, the explanation is you already had your primary infection, now you get the vaccine, and the vaccine gives you a silent infection, and so that, that pushes you into the tertiary fourth and fourth kind of infection. So it moves you out of the secondary uh, enhancement. So it moves you from the first to third and fourth. So, in summary, the CYD TD vaccine has a serostatus dependent performance. It is efficacious and safe in seropositive persons, but it increases the risk of dengue, severe dengue in seronegative persons. So now we are WHO. What do you advise? How do you guide? How best to use this very first, I remember first and only, currently only licensed dengue vaccine in the absence of any other good uh, measures? And WHO takes a population um, uh, based approach. So the public health benefit of CYD TDV is clear, even with this safety issue. So if you look at high seroprevalence rate, let's look at the 70%, because we always talked about 70%. If you vaccinate 1 million um, persons, you will avert, you will prevent 5,600 cases of hospitalization. So this is hospitalized dengue. But you will induce, you will trigger 570 cases in seronegatives. But your overall net value is that you have actually averted 5,000 cases of hospitalized dengue. So this puts us in ethical dilemma. And it's the, the, the New England Journal wrote an editorial around, around these, the, the, when the study results came out, which is beautiful to read, and I encourage you to read it. It's an ethical dilemma of a, of a population level benefit versus an, in, in, an individual risk. In numbers, if you want to quantify this, it means that in a, at a 70% serum prevalence, for every one excess, so extra case that you have induced in a serum negative, you will have seven where you actually prevented hospitalization. At a higher serum prevalence of 85%, for every one excess, you will have pre prevented 18 hospitalized cases. So, with this in mind, we, I, I coordinated the SAGE working group, and we, um, what we did was a very systematic approach, thinking through a scenario of liberal, full use, to no use, with all the scenarios in between. And we discussed every single scenario, we had five scenarios, 
initially that we then um, narrowed down to two scenarios. And the, the one, one was a population cell prevalence cri criteria without screening, but instead of 70%, we were now going to go to 80%, or a pre-vaccination screening strategy. And we looked at, at population benefit versus individual risk, ethical con consideration, risk, perception, communication issues, screening tests versus sera surveys, programmatic issues, vaccine coverage estimates. There are 10 slides around this, and I cannot show them all to you, but I want to show you the principles behind our thinking that made us come to the final conclusion. So, in a, in a population seroprevalence criteria without screening, where you take 80% as your threshold, you will have substantial population benefit, undoubtedly. But you will have harm to 20%. And this is harm to potentially technically identifiable population. This is not an unknown harm when you give a polio vaccine, you don't know which one out of two million will have um, VAP. But here is an identifiable subpopulation which we felt we are not ethically obliged to identify. So in the pre-vaccination screening though, you maximize the benefit in seropositives whilst minimizing the harm in seronegatives. So in a, if you have an 80% setting, you will benefit 80% but harm 20%. In a pre-vaccination screening, your harm depends on the specificity of the, of the test. Now, if you have a test, let's say, of 98% specificity, in an 80% seroprevalence, prevalence, you will falsely vaccinate 0.4% of the population. So 0.4% is far lower than 20%. The risk of population seroprevalence prevalence criteria is also loss in vaccine confidence, as we've seen in the Philippines, and also, if the vaccine does not know whether you are ser positive, ser negative, they live in fear and they may not want to have the vaccine. So we thought through all these issues, implementation issues, coverage issues, and our final conclusion was we preferred the pre-vaccination screening strategy and this is now the recommended strategy to use this first and only licensed dengue vaccine. Now, of course, this strategy has a lot of other um, um, uh, um, challenges, um, not, notwithstanding the you know, developing or validating licensing and a rapid diagnostic test, but also having to do pre-vaccination screening with a little blood prick is programmatically much more difficult and it, it requires new thinking. But I think we now live in a world where we have to be um, progressive, and we have to consider more and more scenarios where we need to do individual pre-screening. Um, for example, just a few weeks, months ago, tafenequin was approved for malaria. You have to, you have to screen for G6PD. There are many conditions where nowadays you have to pre-screen and then you give the drug or you vaccinate. So we need to think around these issues and we have done it for hepatitis B also. So, coming to an end, what is the difference now with the second dengue um, a sec second generation dengue vaccine, the two others that are currently in phase three trials. Will they have the same problem? We don't know and we should not speculate until we have seen the trials, but on theoretical grounds, I think it could be a class effect and we may have the same problem, but maybe to a lesser extent. However, the main differences, and this is important to know, Dengvexia um, is licensed for three doses, six months apart, so needs a 12 months, a little, bit on, a little bit inconvenient kind of scheduling. Takidas has two doses, three months apart, and the Brazilian Butantan has one dose. The indicated age for Dengvex is 9 to 45. For Takida, they are looking at, um, the, the, the trial is for 40 to 16, and the trial for Butantan is 2 to 59. I have showed you the differences in the backbone, I will not repeat it, but just to let you know, if cellular immunity is important for dengue vaccine immunity and long-term immunity, then clearly the Butantan one has the most, is the, has most uh, the dengue vaccine, uh, dengue, uh, most proteins of the dengue virus, 32 versus 16 versus 8. The um, Takeda has, um, uh, will have the readout probably in early 2019, so next year. Um, Butantan as you know, it's a single country study with 17, I think 14 geographic locations, but has 
not see, but there was no dengue outbreak in the, in the last two years. So they will probably have to extend their trial. So for the time being, we only have one vaccine and understanding vaccine. Thank you for your attention.